The Secrets of Stargate is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Stargate, episode 67. General West Jackson has identified the seventh symbol. All right, here we go. We are about to try to make a connection. All we got to do is bust out of here, commandeer the ship, and fly on home. Indeed. You say that a lot. I know that this could be dangerous. But this is our job, right? It's what we signed on to do. It was never about going home. It's about getting us to where we're going. Hi, I'm Jack Barazzini, and you're listening to The Secrets of Stargate, where we talk about the hidden meanings and deeper layers found in the Stargate movies, TV series, and more. And joining me today are Lisa Jones. Hi, Lisa. Hey, Jack. And Victor Lambs. Hey, Victor. Hi, Jack. Today we are discussing the third episode of Season 4, Upgrades. Do you want to give us a rundown on this episode, Victor? Sure. The SGC is visited by a Toka archaeologist named Anise, who brings with her gifts. Three armbands, the last remnants of a long-dead alien race, which will enable the human members of SG-1 the chance to become more than human. After some initial hesitation, and at Anissa's insistence, Jack, Daniel, and Sam put on the armbands and start to exhibit superpowers. Jack becomes super strong and super fast. Daniel becomes super fast. And Sam develops the ability to see in low-light conditions. And she also becomes super fast. (laughs) <laughs> Daniel translates the inscription on the armbands and heeds too late the immortal words of Spider-Man that with great power comes great responsibility. And the audience watches in horror as the armbands turn SG-1 into super hungry, super hormonal, super insubordinate jerks. Anise gently manipulates SG-1 into defying General Hammond's orders and attacking a secret ghoul base where Apophis is building an advanced but not yet fully operational battle station. Only a team with SG-1 superpowers could hope to infiltrate the planet and blow up his new ship. Thanks to their super speed and super strength, SG-1 busts out of the SGC and does the infiltrating part of Apophis' base okay, but as they try to escape, their armbands fall off and they get really sleepy. For you see, their upgrades were installed with the virus, which is the newfound sources of SG-1's newfound superpowers, but this virus is ultimately susceptible to the team's own antibodies, and once natural immunity has been developed against the virus, The armbands cannot be reactivated. Fortunately, Teal'c is there to save the day and help Daniel, Jack, and Sam get back to the gate. Apophis' new battleship blows up, and Jack, Sam, and Daniel apologize to General Hammond for being such goobers. The end. (laughs) Pretty much sums it up. (laughs) Pretty good. Uh, Yeah, beware uh, Tok'ra bearing gifts. Indeed. It's definitely one of the messages of this episode. (laughs) What are your thoughts on this episode, Lisa? I think this is an awesome episode. It's so much fun. And uh, all of the humor and the quips, and uh, which I read was not originally in there. It was a serious episode that Robert C. Cooper rewrote, which is kind of cool. It's one of those, I, I feel like I didn't even need to watch again because it just really stands out the test of time, 20 years. I don't know. It's just, it's hysterical and fun. And... I guess if you if you want to talk about the Spider-Man reference, you you know we could talk about absolute power corrupts absolutely, and uh, was it really the virus or was it power? Was it, you know all the uh, psychology of of what happened to them? Mm-hmm. We can get into that in a minute. <laughs> yeah, definitely. What about you, Victor? Yeah, I I like this episode. It feels kind of. Um... Not schizophrenic, but it starts off, you know, and and you, I, I was timing like, you know, at what minute point certain things happened, and then I was remembering this episode, and I was like, okay, they're they're starting to like, you know, get under the thrall of these things, and I was like, don't they like go to a planet at some point and like do something, and then it, with like fifteen minutes or ten minutes left in the episode, they kind of like trigger the plot, which is, oh yeah, we're also going to blow up a battleship or something. So, I I thought the two halves could have been better integrated, but I didn't. I didn't know that Robert C. Cooper had rewritten this. I was watching this and I was like, gosh, this David Rich guy, he, he's very quippy and very, uh, very lively with his <laughs> writing. But I guess if it, was, if it underwent a rewrite, that would uh, explain it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I wouldn't say it's my favorite. I liked the first half of the episode more than the second half when they actually go to the planet to blow up the ship. That almost felt tacked on to me. 
but all the stuff with them on Earth, like learning how to use their powers and then going to the bar and, or going to the bar and grill and getting into the bar fight and all that, like that was fun. I enjoyed that. Yeah. And it really does just show like there's a power disparity between the Tok'ra and the SGC where even though the Tok'ra are on their side, it almost comes across as more of a matter of convenience because they can help them against the gold. Like they don't really have Earth's best interests in mind. And I guess yeah. that's that gold kind of that gold psychology coming through with that where even when they're going to help them, it's they don't always they cannot always be trusted. Yeah. You humans are, how do you say, food for cannons? <laughs> yeah, much, yeah. Basically, yeah. 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 Yeah, it, yeah a little of that arrogance and, uh, well, if, if you won't help us immediately after walking in the door, then eh, we'll go find somebody else. And then there's, puts Hammond between a rock and a hard place, right? He knows it's probably wrong and probably not going to end up well, but what's their mission, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. to bring back technology and so kind of needs to say yes. Plus, she's a good looking Tokra. So let's not, you know, we, we didn't say that yet. Right. They're all like, no, <laughs> yeah. we don't like the Tokra, <laughs> except for maybe that one. <laughs> yeah. When, when uh, Daniel's making goo goo eyes at her, when it's like, oh, really? You're an archaeologist, too. And Jack turns around and gives him this like, like, like please look, you know, it was just it was yeah. one of the best Jack looks, I think. And, um, yeah, but Anise is like almost diabolical here. Like Dr. Frazier expresses some reservations early on. It's like, oh yeah, how does that sensor work? Can I, can I see your iPad there? And, and Anise is like, oh, there'll be time for that. I'll show you it all later. But first we have to, you know, get these guys on a treadmill. And then, yeah, so mm-hmm. it's basically up to Dr. Frazier to, to do her own homework. Basically, Anise is all like, you know, follow the science. And, uh, Dr. Frazier's like, no, I'm going to do my own research. And then Dr. Uh, you know, she goes to Hammond with, uh, with her suspicions and stuff. And this really does become uh, general Hammond's episode. You know, he's yeah. has some really good scenes in this one where, you know, he, he is caught between that rock and a hard place, but, um, you know, calling Jack out, recognizing that he's somewhat under the influence of this thing and doesn't want to totally alienate him or anything. But so I, I think it was some really good general Hammond, some really good Dr. Frazier moments in this one. Yeah, definitely. I liked uh I like that we got that back and forth between them where Dr. Fraser really was advocating for the team and for their best interest and Hammond was kind of stuck in the middle where he wants the benefits of the technology they're getting because that's one of their main missions. But he also doesn't like the fact that SG1 is basically being used as guinea pigs. Yeah. And Hammond even gets to say at some point, you know, if there's one thing I've learned in my time here, it's that there's nothing wrong with a little prudence when, you know, dealing with an alien device is concerned. And uh, yeah, I mean, he's following his instincts, Fraser's following hers. And um, it's about 16 minutes in when we get to our first, you know, twist or complication. And that's like the armbands don't come off. And I don't know Mm -hmm. if they have a really good explanation for that. I mean, Supposedly, you know, Jack has the strength of 10 men or something, and you'd think that he'd be able to, you know, rip Just anything rip off right of off, him. Yeah. yeah. But, and that kind of is also like one of the conceits of this whole superpower thing is that, you know, he can, I don't know, this is the whole like how superpower works. Does it make his like bones stronger and his muscles stronger? Because like the things he's doing, like they would just shatter his bones and liquefy all of his internal organs. Like, accelerating right, that pass gotta, and stop yeah yeah you kind of gotta just go with it because the virus explanation doesn't really explain any of those aspects of it but again it's a science fiction yeah. show so i'm okay with kind of kind of ignoring that i do find it interesting how they kind of waffle back and forth like as they're getting more powerful they're also getting more arrogant and they kind of believe that they can do whatever they want like at like when they get uh, locked up and then they decide because of the dangers of the powers they have and they decide to just skip out and go get four steaks, <laughs> um, which to me, that seems like the best benefit of this thing is you can eat four steaks and not gain weight. I mean, that sounds pretty nice. But uh, Except for you get a diet drink. Yeah. That was a really nice dive bar too, O'Malley's or whatever it was. Like they show the inside, you're like, oh yeah, dive bar. And then they show the outside and it looks like, you know, a park, a place where they have like valet parking or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So 
Yeah, and it does really seem like it boils down to their hormones are just all over the place, which is giving them poor judgment. But yes, but is that it? I mean, yeah, I don't know. I I could see a little bit of kind of like when Jackson in Hammond's office, and he's like, "We just." It's just so darn exciting, you know, like mm-hmm. just to be full of all of this power and invincibility and just think I'm sitting here. So, yes, hormones and bad judgment, but also, you know, all of the stuff they usually do. And now they can right. do better, you know. Yeah, so, it kind of ex- accentuates yeah. all their negative traits. Yeah, all their personalities. Mm-hmm. I did like uh, Jack saying, like, shouldn't we be out there doing the damage instead of your office right after he's just kicked a hole in, like, General Hammond's wall. And General Hammond, you know, it's like half laughing when he says it is, you know, just get out of my office, you know. Yeah. And so it shows that he's not ready to write Jack off yet like he has, you know, maybe in the past. But, you know, his patience is wearing thin. Yeah, mm-hmm. I did like that he kind of chuckled when he said it. Of course, then they, you know, they escaped to O'Malley's or whatever, and then they totally blame Carter. <laughs> yeah, even though it was 100% Jack's decision. <laughs> I do like that part, though, where, uh, so, like, the whole escalation of that is uh, Carter has soundly beated, beat these guys in pool and collected all their money, and uh, Daniel makes, like, an offhand comment, and the guy's like, what did you say, geek? And that was the thing that set him yeah. off. It's like, <laughs> not like, this time. Yeah, not today. <laughs> what are you, McFly chicken? Yeah. <laughs> That's basically how, how it went yeah. out. But I did like a, was the dudes in the sleeveless shirts coming up to Jack and him saying, well, this is a cliche. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I was sitting there wondering how many of those guys also play <laughs> Jaffa. Right, Jaffa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's probably the same people who were the Jaffa later on in the episode. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's all the same guys. <laughs> the little uh, Jaffa ricochet people. <laughs> like when <laughs> when uh, SG-1 is like pinballing around there, like pew, pew, and like being pulled back on their <laughs> strings like they're on the A-team or something. Yeah. That was funny. Yeah. Did, did y'all talk about Siler getting knocked off? No. No, we haven't, we haven't done that yet. <laughs> Yes, that was That's my like, favorite part of the episode. Yeah. It was, Poor guy, right? And it's such a weird beat, too, because, like, you're, like, this is, like, you're laughing because, like, he does it, like, so communically. He's like, ah, you know, you're like, oh, Siler, <laughs> you always get knocked over. And then they show him and he's, like, laying there bleeding <laughs> yeah. on the stairs with, like, broken bones. And you're like, oh, oh, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> then you feel bad. Yeah. Like. Okay, they're really dangerous, right? They don't know they are, but they're mm-hmm. really dangerous. But it was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, Dan Shea plays, uh, who plays Siler, is, uh, you know, Richard Dean Anderson's stunt double as well. So whenever he's on the show, they're, they're either like throwing him over a railing or, or something or electrocuting him or something like that. Mm-hmm. Or he's holding <laughs> nice. a big wrench. <laughs> yeah. It's like how comedic it is. He's just like, hey, Siler, slaps him on the back and yeah. over he goes. Yeah. No Wilhelm scream, but uh, I can live without that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so the whole reason, I don't know if we mentioned this at the top of the show, but the whole reason that the Tokra need SG-1 to test out these wristbands is because they do not work if you have a gold, because that counteracts the uh, the virus that connects you with it. So Teal is not able to get one. It's just Sam, Jack, and Daniel. Um. And so Teal'c is kind of the, he's the level-headed person in this episode of the team because he's not <laughs> under the influence and he kind of sees what's going on. And we get that fun boxing scene between him and Jack soon after Jack gets the band and he doesn't really feel like it's doing anything. And mm-hmm. we get that, that Matrix moment where he's just kind of, Teal'c's trying to go at him and he just dodges it and then he totally just lays him out. And you think about it, it was a, it was a opposite of the scene from the fifth race when they were boxing. Mm-hmm. He was teaching uh, Teal'c how to box, right? And this time, Jack lays out Teal. He knocks him right. so hard. He actually hurts him, which, you know, in a normal world, that just doesn't happen. So it was kind of a nice uh, juxtaposition to the fifth race episode of them boxing. Mm-hmm. I guess that was last time we saw them boxing. Yeah, it was. And then back when they're in the infirmary, uh, Jack apologizes to Teal and Teal says, you're not sorry. And Jack said, no, I'm <laughs> yeah. not. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was. I love those little moments, and 
And I loved um, Dr. Frazier throughout this episode because she's mm-hmm. so, she's like so frustrated and she's like, like giving daggers through her eyes, you know, the way she's looking at a niece. <laughs> like, it's just like, you just expect her to like stomp her feet and be like, listen, <laughs> how many alien viruses are we letting through this base? You know, what are we doing? Yeah, this is really the kind of thing where you think they would quarantine the devices and then run thorough tests, but Anise is just yeah. pushing it through, just wants to test it all without even verifying it, which is just fishy to begin with. And then, of course, yeah. we learn the twist, which is they know that uh, Apophis is building a new class of gold mothership, and they've known this from the beginning, and they want SG-1 to use these their heightened powers with these armbands to go and destroy that mothership. And she plays it off like, oh, we just found this out. And oh, isn't it convenient yeah. you have these powers? But that comes out pretty quickly that yeah. she was manipulating the situation so they could do that. Yeah. Who actually believes her? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, and so I like them, the kind of match cut they had there. And, you know, even by revealing it, Anise is still manipulating them because she's like, Oh, I'll upload, I'll upload all the data to your mainframe. And of course, yeah. Carter, with her speed typing skills now, can, can get that. And there's a really nice match cut where like SG-1 is looking at the, you know, the surveillance footage. And then it realized it's actually Hammond and Teal'c looking at it as well. And Teal'c's like, I can't do this myself. And then um, SG-1, of course, runs up to the control room and Vulcan nerve pinches everybody, <laughs> which is a skill I guess they can do when they're super powered. No, they, ha- they had injectables. Oh, was it? A, was it a hypo spray? Yeah. Or something? Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't yeah. notice. Yeah, that. okay. <laughs> I thought it was a Vulcan nerve pinch. My son thought it was like a hypo spray or something, but yeah, I don't know. My head cannon is that their superpowers included like Vulcan nerve pinch, and then, and then yeah, so they're through the gate, and then they're just like zipping around, like just knocking Jaffa over, like it's no big deal. Yeah, and, and yeah. So that that part was kind of funny. I would say you're you're at that point, like Jack said, you're close to the end of the episode. So you're thinking, what what's gonna happen now? And it, it just mm-hmm. all falls apart pretty quickly. All right. They're so they're on the ship. They've uh yeah. They've got the I like the part where so they get on the ship, they get past all the Jaffa, they figure out that they can run through the shields that are guarding mm-hmm. the that was cool. Uh the gas pipes basically that are controlling the it's basically the thermal exhaust vent on the Death Star that they have to blow up. Um, I like how every time they encounter the gold in like a battle like this, it's just a Star Wars plot to destroy something. Um, but they can run through the shield because it oscillates at a certain frequency and they can jump through that with their super speed. Uh, but at one point they see two uh, gold carrying this tiny little brick of Naquita on the stretcher. And they're like, do they need two guys to carry that? And it's extremely dense. So... Daniel goes and picks it up with one hand uh, to come back with it. And that's when his uh, powers start to wear off and he just collapses to the ground. Yeah. He's like, is this, is this heavy on his little backpack? And then Carter's yeah. taking her hat off going, it's hot. Why is it so hot? And it's interesting that Jack, who put the armband on way before anyone else, is the one who it affects him negatively and it falls off last. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I mean, maybe because he has more body mass at this point relative to Daniel and, and Sam. I don't know. True. Maybe Could he doesn't be, yeah. metabolize things as fast because he's yeah. his age. That's true. We all, we all know our metabolism slows down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, and so that's the, the whole answer to why did this advanced race who created these devices that make you super powerful, why did they die out? It's because once your body develops antibodies to the virus that ca- gives you that power, you cannot use it more than once, which it would be nice if COVID vaccine did that, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> yeah. Like gave you superpowers for, uh, for a few superpowers. days. Yeah. Or let you not get it. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. So, this is so- just- yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> this is a, um, on Atlantis, they, they do this a number of times where they'll, you know, Atlantis, uh, Stargate Atlantis is, you know, they're on the, this ancient city and the whole city isn't available to them at first. But as they access par- different parts of the city, they keep running into labs that were designed by the ancients. And there's usually some piece of technology there that the ancients abandoned because 
it pretty much was like this and had like some monkey's paw, you know, Faustian <laughs> bargain involved. And there's one where Rodney McKay it comes across an ancient device that seems to give him superpowers, but then it turns out, you know, that there is a, a downside to it, just very much like this one. And we'll uh, get to that one, but it's, it's, he's very it's fun. angsty about it. Yes. <laughs> they, they keep coming back to it and it, it but it's a good story. But it, if you think about, I can't remember the, the race of the people who oh. uh, created the armbands. I know it's an A. I can't think the of it. Anticas. Yeah. Close enough. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Attachniks a, a, a or Attaniques. Attaniques. That's how she yeah. said it. Yeah, so Atonique. if you think about it, does that mean that they were biologically close to human? Since it works on the human. They haven't said how many other races they've tried it on or other peoples. They just know that it won't work on Tok'ra. It won't work on Gould. So it, yeah. just, it just made you think, who are these people? And I believe they said they predate the Gould. So where they come from? What well, I mean, we know they they died off. Who are mm. they fighting? You know, it's it's just it opens a lot of doors. And so Daniel Speed reads her journal, and it's really long for the fact that she never answered some serious questions. And he asks, and she didn't even look at, didn't even consider those questions. Like, what to, happened to them? To be fair, <laughs> most of her journal was quantum leap fan fiction that she'd written. <laughs> And <laughs> that's why Daniel and seems to skip for like absinthe. <laughs> the absinthe recipes for absinthe. Real writes in a notebook. She likes the tactile, which is true. I, I write in a notebook too. I write in a notebook I, too. I think, I mean, I think we can just assume that they're the ancients because this is something that the ancients would have done to mm -hmm. fight their enemies. And then, whoops, it doesn't work. Let's bury it, you know. Let's start over. <laughs> That's a good head headcanon, because I don't think we will see this technology or this race again. No, but we do get to see Anise again. Cause... Yeah, she comes up several more times. Yeah, yeah. I think I did read somewhere they were trying to uh, find a uh, know, more good-looking alien, you know? I guess we, we got rid of Hathor, and, you know, so we need to find someone, you know, feminine and pretty. Um, again, and so she, she does stick around for a couple of episodes and then, and then she's out of there. So I don't know if it didn't work or people didn't care. I, I don't know. Or she was just annoying. <laughs> she was pretty annoying. <laughs> like, no offense. Yeah. She, <laughs> she was better in spies like us. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, I did read know, uh... that she was supposed to be the original Xena warrior princess. Oh, was she really? That she won the role, and then I, I can't remember when I read it if she got ill or something happened, and she couldn't get to New Zealand, and so they had to film in time, and so they had to pick someone new. And then by and that point, Bob Lucy Tapert Lawless. had married Lucy Lawless or something, and nobody <laughs> yeah. else was getting. But yeah, it was weird, though, because that explains it, because like if you're watching Hercules, The Legendary Journeys, Lucy Lawless comes in as a character that's not Xena, and then like oh. six episodes later... If I'm remembering correctly, she's like this character Xena, you know, because obviously she was like the guest star. And then if she got this role unexpectedly, they're like, okay, now you're Xena and you're not this other yeah. character anymore. It also <laughs> said that she auditioned for Seven of Nine in Voyager. That I could have seen, yeah. Yeah, didn't get it, obviously. But, oh, and Hallmark reference. I did see her in a Hallmark movie, I think a year or two ago. So Nice. She's still working also, in Vancouver. Uh, this is the first you got the, the Star Trek reference in for the episode I before did. either Victor yeah. or I. <laughs> so now y'all have to drink. <laughs> yeah. Our drinking game for Star, Star Trek references. <laughs> <laughs> I do um I do want to know what Jacob was doing. Like, was he in on this plan at all or did they keep him in the dark? Because I feel like he would have said, Hey, you're not gonna use my daughter as a guinea pig for this weird technology. Yeah. He he had to have been like off world or and it, don't we find out later that like the Tok'ra don't always tell Jacob about everything? Mm -hmm. I think I think that's a something that comes up. Keep him busy somewhere mm. else, like yeah. away. Yeah. That oh, kind so of a this conflict of interest because they know he'll care. The uh, force field mm -hmm. that looked saran cool. wrap with saran wrap. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh wow! I mean, with with That's obviously awesome. they added effects to it, 
but I know. I think that one was super cool. And we get to see a lot of scenes from this in another episode. So, like reused scenes? No, no, actually, because trust me, I've watched it enough times. Like when when Divide and Conquer came out, you you keep you're like, wait, did I miss that? And then you go back and you watch this one, and you're like, no, no, that didn't happen in this one. So yeah, there's a that we see a niece Freya come back based on stuff that happened in this episode, and then they. So I'm assuming they filmed it all at the same time, but oh, just, nice, I don't that's know cool. yet. So there's little extra scenes that we don't see. I don't know how many that is. I think I think it's just a couple episodes. I think it's it might be the I don't think it's the very next one, but it's the next few. We should see her again. They probably kind of filmed mm-hmm. it filmed it all in a block. Okay, but yeah, so phrase. yeah. Yeah, I do like how like before 3D printing, whenever they needed like an alien device, it always looked like it was like, you know, molded out of like Sculpey or something. And I think we lose that now where where you can just like 3D print a alien prop or something and have it look like whatever you want. I don't know. I got to say like I miss I miss that era of props where it was more they had to be more inventive because they couldn't do everything they can now. And it makes me even more upset when you have something like um, in the second season of Picard, the tricorders are literally galaxy uh, flip, the galaxy flip phones, the like oh, the ones no. with the foldable screen with a 3D printed case around it. And when they're using them on screen, you can literally see, you see the camera hole like up at the top and you see mm. the crease. Like they didn't even try to hide it. So I prefer something <laughs> where... If they, if they had done that kind of thing in the 90s, I'd be like, well, yeah, they're choosing off the shelf stuff. But now I feel like the production is to a level where when they do things like that, it sticks out way more. Yeah. Well, and we had, I mean, shows like this, you kind of had fun because you're looking at it going, that looks like something, you know, like, what is it? Like the, uh, yeah. what's the device they put on their um, temple for the memory recall? Remember Martouf had the little metal the thing? Nose, to, yeah, the, the, it was nose, a nose yeah. hair trimmer. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So, <laughs> but you didn't know that it just looked like a little shiny But There's thing. like this uh, fiber optic like piece of like, I think it's for like doing like light testing or something. And it's like this big machine has like a rod going through the middle that shoots like a red fiber optic light through it. And if you see it in uh, Last Starfighter, multiple different episodes of Next Generation, you see it in some of the Star Wars movies. Like I saw a supercut of all the different times this piece of industrial equipment had shown up in science fiction oh, shows. Oh, cool! And it's, it's a lot. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know on Andromeda they have like these little handheld communication devices, and it's obvious it's like whatever like off market or off brand like MP3 player. Like you know, <laughs> it looks like you know like. <laughs> Uh, you know, with like just a different like colored case or buttons on it and stuff, but it's it's yeah, repurposing uh, electronics as as futuristic props be a pretty fun yeah, job. It's always fun. So I'm glad they went with a comedic angle for this episode because the mm-hmm. when they're using their powers, it's just too it looks too silly for it to be taken seriously. And so I'm glad they <laughs> didn't try to juxtapose that with yeah. having it be a dark serious plot. Because it would not have it worked. Is, yeah. It is the 1990s version of the Flash TV show, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which it still is looks like something from the 90s. Speculate, interesting to speculate. It, it, if it wasn't supposed to be comedy or fun, and it was supposed to be more dark or serious, kind of, I mean, I'm assuming Siler falling off was an obvious one, right? He was really hurt. It was serious and he was really hurt. But what else? I mean, how were they... You know, what think, else were they doing to get Jack, in trouble or to make it dark? Yeah, Jack was going to nuke New York or something, I think. <laughs> and then Sam turned into some sort of quantum being and was going to stop him. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> uh, I haven't read The Watchmen. They probably didn't go for um, steaks and <laughs> diet, diet sodas, right? <laughs> yeah. No, and they wouldn't have gotten the ending, too, where it's like, you know, they get back and, like, Hammond's there and it's like, I just want you to know, General, I'm really sorry. And Sam goes, yeah. me too. And Daniel goes, me three. And then Tilk goes, I have nothing to apologize for. And Hammond's like, Tilk was <laughs> acting under my orders for a change or something. You know, it's like, 
It was a nice ending. I like, oh, you I like guys. <laughs> yeah, it was. I, I like liked it. It's a, it's a good, like, kind of lighthearted em- ending to it. Because this episode could the have part... been like need part two. You know, if you think about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Although I do feel like the part where they all turn and look at the camera and laugh before it cuts to the credits uh, was a bit yeah. over the top. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Starter, <Stardew>, starter, <Stardew. laughs> But it, it did. Did it end with Anise like standing by herself in front of the Stargate and like staring off into space? And I'm thinking, oh, I mean, I already know, but it's like, oh mm-hmm. no, are you now a main character? Stop it. <laughs> yeah. I, th- I think trying didn't to picture they... is that, but yeah. It I think they work. did say like, this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship or something at the end, or like, mm-hmm. I guess we'll be working with you again. But yeah. 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 And even Daniel wasn't like, oh, yeah, my archaeology buddy whose name means whatever and my name means whatever. And Jack's like, my name means what's in the box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's hard to imagine this episode without all of the cute quips. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, it just works been, better in that yeah. framework. It just fits in the Stargate world, right? It's just what they, it's what they do. It is what they do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess if you were going to do, this is a serious plot. I don't know if you, y'all have seen the movie Chronicle. Um, Mm-mm. It's this, it's like a found footage superhero movie about these teenagers who develop these superpowers, but it's supposed to be realistic quote unquote. And it's all about how if you actually had the power to fly or shoot lightning out of your hands, there'd be horrible consequences because you wouldn't know what to do and you'd end up like killing people by accident. Um, so it kind of takes that premise, but then does it in a more ground, I guess I'm so tired of things being referred to as gritty or grounded, but it tries to be mm. more realistic, I guess, than Superman or whatever. Yeah. I'm more familiar with the uh, sci-fi show that only lasted, I think, for 13 episodes called The Chronicle which uh, starred John Polito. Um, I think the guy who played Damar on Star Trek was on it, but it was about these like tabloid reporters who like investigate things and they're all real, you know, all these mysteries and stuff and they have to like set things right. But that has nothing to do with this. Bat Boy in it. <laughs> uh, I don't know if they did a Bat Boy episode. I, I should tr- try and find that again. But yeah, if you could find uh, The Chronicle, it's one of those shows that was like really cool, but they canceled it after... Oh, 22 episodes. Nice. Pig Boy was in it. Curtis Armstrong, who played uh, Booger on um, Better Off Dead. <laughs> Better Off Dead. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, Met- nice. and, and Metatron on uh, Supernatural and stuff. Yeah, he, he was on it as Pig Boy for 14 episodes. Oh, nice. Like. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Hmm. Awesome. Uh, did you all have any other thoughts on this Stargate episode? I actually looked up the foreign language titles. And there's oh, a nice. bunch of them yeah, that are different this time, not just the Germans. So the French called it hazardous experimentation. I'll allow it. it. Yeah. <laughs> Italians called it strengthening. The Spanish okay. transformations. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, the Czech Adenique, is that, is that how you say it? Adenique legacy. Okay. okay. Hungarians called it upgrades. So give, give thumbs up to the Hungarians there. The Russians called it Upgraded Ones. Okay. The Upgraded Ones. And then the Germans called it Legacy of the Adeniques. Ah, okay. So not a good start or... Yeah. Or, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> a little more l- literal, again, literal to what the episode was, right? <laughs> See, we were right about the Ubermensch. Yeah. <laughs> I think the uh, the French have to have to win this round. Yeah, it's a experimentation. experimentation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wasn't that a Prince nice. song? Uh, maybe not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> what about you, Victor? Uh, no, the I think we talked uh, talked about everything except um when, like, it's so weird that like Carter's first superpower is that she can like see in the dark or like <laughs> in low light, you know. And then Dr. Frazier, uh, you know, shines the pen light in her eyes and her pupils don't dilate. So I just think that they gave her like those like eye drops, you know, those anti-dilation uh, yeah. eye drops that you get at the eye doctor. And I really commend Amanda Tapping for that because 
I hate those things. Like I will claw my way out of any <laughs> eye exam before I let them give me those things. So I admire her like, you know, method acting, if that's what it was, you know, unless that was like CG or something. But yeah, so I thought that was uh, real convincing either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, they, they did a good job of that. Yeah, those are not fun, especially when you have to drive home afterwards. I agree. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up, when we would get the day off from school to go to the eye doctor, my mom would like say she'd take us to like, you know, a movie right afterwards. <laughs> and so, <laughs> oh. To reward us. And so we'd get these eye drops. And like the last place you want to be is in a movie theater right afterwards. But yeah, it was it was cool. Like I think that's why I like the Muppets Take Manhattan is like still etched into my retinas someplace. Because it was <laughs> burned into your brain. Yeah. Wasn't yeah. that one in 3D? I don't know if that one was or, or not, but it was in 3D one either way when I saw it. <laughs> it felt like it for you. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. All right. Um, before we go, I'd like to invite everyone to join us on our SQPN Discord. You can find that at sqpn.com slash Discord. And we actually have some feedback from our Stargate channel there. 10 AF says on our Discord, just for the record, in defense of Jack in 100 days, uh, Richard Dean Anderson has said that O'Neill didn't know that Lara was pregnant, if she actually even was, because O'Neill would not have let his child grow up without a father if he had known. I, I hope that that was what the intent was, but it's not really telegraphed in the episode, in my opinion. No. The kid is not my son. <laughs> doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> I, I like that. <laughs> we disagreed on this episode and that this we've gotten so much feedback on 100 Days, right? Yeah. That, that you know, some of us hated it. <laughs> And thought it was out of character, and some of us did not. Not though that he would leave his kid, but I just meant yeah. he was suicidal in the mm -hmm. movie, but he's not here, and you know. So I, I love that people, the other people, care so much about this episode because it, yeah, yeah. One hundred, the one hundred days. I like the episode. It could have been redeemed if if they'd honored its legacy. <laughs> but like the very next time he goes back to that planet, he's he's like there for like. <laughs> 30 seconds and gates off looking over his shoulder so <laughs> he's nervous yeah I, I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's one of those things where maybe they can in a revival uh they can maybe yeah. bring back his son as a new character who needs to meet his meet his dad and richard dean anderson didn't know about him or something like that and they can give some reason like oh he needed to be kept secret because of the gold or whatever there's ways they can work that in i feel like because the sun would basically be Amish. Well, they did bring, they did start to mine like the Trinium or Naquita or whatever was there, right? So he would have some knowledge of Earthways, I guess. It wouldn't all be barn raising and whatever. Re drinking rot gut. Yeah, rot gut. <laughs> <laughs> Just makes moonshine on a planet. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, before we go, we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Stargate, including Kevin M., Cheryl J., Ann T., Caleb P., and Michael M. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Stargate and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give, and be sure to follow the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or on the SQPN YouTube channel. To find previous episodes of Secrets of Stargate and to send feedback, please visit sqpn.com slash stargate. And you can email us at stargate at sqpn.com or follow StarQuest on social media at facebook.com slash starquestmedia or on Twitter at sqpn. And we'll be back next time and we'll be discussing the next episode of SG-1, Crossroads. Until then, Lisa Jones, thank you for sharing in the Secrets of Stargate. Thanks, Jack. And Victor Lambs, thank you too. Thanks, Jack, and I'm attempting to make physical contact with you, O'Neill. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, I'm Jack. It means what's in the box. Thank you for listening to Secrets of Stargate on StarQuest. Anyway, I'm sorry, but that just happens to be how I feel about it. What do you think? <laughs>